Karina, feel free to go ahead. All right, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Karina Quintana. I am an electrical engineer, electrophysicist scientist with the Boeing Company at China Lake, California. Uh, that's a Navy base. So I'm gonna go ahead and attempt to share my screen. All right, it's very exciting to be here with you all today for this hybrid air show and STEM event. Um, I have the pleasure of being able to share my journey as an intern uh, to a full-time engineer supporting the uh, advanced sen sensors on the F-18 Hornet and Super Hornet platform. So I'll be telling you about the basic airborne radar principles during the second portion of my brief. There we go. So just a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in a small town in Miami, Florida. And uh, growing up, uh, our parents always instilled in uh, my sister and I a dedication to strive and succeed at school because they did so uh, for family and work. I have an older sister, Jessica, who's about two years older than me, and she was the first person in our family uh, to learn English and go to college. So our parents always uh, supported us personally and professionally. But growing up, we didn't have as much luxury with financial support. Uh, growing up, I also didn't have a dream career or a calling, if that's what uh, you want to call it. Um, you can see a picture of me on the bottom left hand corner. I was about two years old there just holding a whole bunch of color pencils uh, because I really liked uh, drawing and interior design. I also enjoyed watching a lot of Food Network. Chopped was my favorite show. So at one point I thought I wanted to be a professional chef. Um, in the end though, I developed a great passion for um, math, algebra two and calculus two ended up being my favorite subjects in school. So like I said, I'm from um, Miami, Florida. I was raised under Cuban uh, Venezuelan parent Tripoli. I was selected as one of 20 scholars in the nation to be part of a cool program called Project Connect. Um, I received full funding to attend this conference in Tampa, Florida. So they had a lot of neat books and resources, gave me a different perspective on learning. Uh, but best of all, I was part of, an, or I participated in an industry panel. Um, and at the time I was really considering uh, staying in school to get my doctorate in electrical engineering. But meeting um, industry professionals such as Dr. Julio Navarro uh, from Boeing really inspired me to try to pursue uh, industry experience uh, right after graduating from FIU with my bachelor's. So fast forward to 2014 era, I got my internship offer with GE Healthcare. It was a great experience spending my first summer away from home. I was in Vermont learning how to code in JavaScript and C Sharp, but I realized that this was really, really challenging. And even though I had taken the classes and gotten A's and B's, um, and I was treated like a real in a real engineer, even though I was just a, a summer hire, um, I decided to change my major to electrical engineering. I had gotten enough experience at the conferences to realize what I wanted to do with my career. So um, as a sophomore in college, um, I came back to school and then started studying electrical engineering. The classes were really similar. So hopefully, um, I like to think that it worked out and um, I'm glad that I'm able to share that experience with you all. I'd like to talk about ASI. This is uh, the Alliance of Hispanic Serving Institution Educators. Uh, this is an organization that's not as well known as the other ones I've talked about. Um, but to me, it was a great experience being able to attend their conference in San Antonio, Texas. I was one of three national scholars. Um, they had one for each tier and I represented the bachelor's tier. And not everybody came from a STEM background. There were business majors and art majors and people from all over the world that had reconvened um, to talk about Title V grants and how government aid for Hispanic serving institutions could really, really make a difference um, at a state and national level. 
So um, this conference continues to be held and I included that information as well. But it was my chance to share the technical background that I had gained. And then came Great Minds in STEM, uh, GMIS. By far, uh, this is my favorite and um, I guess dearest organization that I've been a part of. Uh, Great, Mind, Great Minds in STEM hosts the first national STEM conference each academic year. So if you're considering studying engineering, science, math, anything related um, to those fields, you definitely want to start considering this um, as soon as possible. They have many opportunities for scholarship applications, even when you're in high school. Um, that's how I started getting involved. I received a scholarship from NASA Marshall Space Flight Center in 2014. It was a $2,500 scholarship that allowed me to travel to New Orleans and how important um, safety. So I developed some of the training material for the air-to-air -air capabilities. And I realized that the radar matters most. That's why it's at the front of the aircraft. So you get to realize that how you interact with the aircraft um, via the push buttons or the displays is really, really important. So as an intern, I, I gained all of this experience and I was able to network with all of our Boeing Channel Lake teammates and our customers, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and all the foreign customers as well. So it really uh, showed me how important learning and exposure is and also um, how much you know people and how willing they are to help you get to where you want to be. So I focused a lot on my personal and professional goals as well, constantly reassessing what I wanted to do in the future. Um, so as you can see, I have a lot of um, nice pictures with lots of people and beautiful aircraft. So I would consider the Boeing Channel Lake internship experience to be the greatest ever. Um, here you see a picture of our recruiting pamphlet from the national STEM conferences that we attend every single year. Um, I've been part of the intern program for five years as a professional and everything on this page is true. You do work on the latest electronic mission and avionic systems. You assist with test planning and reporting. You're in lab, you're on the aircraft. Um, you get to engage with all types of products um, from design to the data that gets put out in the end. So um, with no doubt about it, I came back to China Lake after I graduated from FIU with my degree in electrical engineering. This was back in 2016. So I started um, as an entry level engineer um, doing test and evaluation at China Lake. So if you wanna read more about my story, um, FIU News published an article um, where they interviewed me and I shared um, all the nitty gritty great details about my first job. In 2018, um, I moved up to a professional level two, still doing test and evaluation at China Lake. But at this point, I was considered uh, the subject matter expert on the APG-73 radar, which is the mechanically scanned array radar I showed you earlier. And I was a statement of requirements or SOAR lead for all seven programs that the US Navy, Marine Corps, and the foreign customers had. Um, the Marine Corps was also uh, upgrading to a newer uh, active electronically scanned array radar or an AESA radar. So I was a systems engineer on this program as well. And here I wanted to share with you um, this chart that I used um, for performance results, personal growth, and collective work products. I always considered three things, skills, accountability, and commitment. And I held all the people I led on my SOAR team um, to those standards as well. And here I am today um, in 2020, back in March, um, I transitioned to a professional level three. Um, since I was heavily supporting all of the foreign military sales customers on the radar side, um, I assumed a new role for our customer. And now I serve as the lead systems engineer for all of those customers um, that have F-18 Hornets or the A through D variant. So I tried laying out a map so you all can see how many aircraft are um, owned by each country and again more values that come from our customer and that I try to embody every day. Do right, know your craft, and then take care of your people. So these are some pictures um, from 2015 to 2020. Um, hopefully I gave you a good perspective on what it's like to transition from being an intern 
to an electrical engineer or any kind of engineer. Um, it takes a lot of hard work, but uh, before we wrap up, I'm going to share um, some basic principles of airborne radar that you can apply on your day-to-day -day life or um, schoolwork. And then um, I'll wrap up with some final tidbits of wisdom. So one uh, quote that the radar team had was, know your RF, again, that stands for radio frequency, know your RF because everything else is fluff. So radar is actually an acronym and it stands for radio detection and ranging. And radars essentially operate by transmitting electromagnetic energy toward any area of interest or responsibility and then making sure that the energy that's reflected from targets is uh, detected in turn. So targets of interest, um, imagine another aircraft flying, an airliner, um, those are obscured in a background of many, many things. Um, false targets, things that you don't mean to detect, clutter, um, interference, for example, uh, there can be a mountain in the way of the line of sight of the radar. That's very common in California with the Sierras. You also have countermeasures that are trying to deceive um, the detection of that energy. And then internal and electronic, uh, internal and external electronic noise. So there's a lot of complex uh, circuitry involved in these radar systems. And all of that um, plays a factor in trying to detect any target um, that the radar is uh, sanitizing in the airspace. So in terms of measurements, we have four key things. Uh, we have angles in azimuth, which are horizontal, and in elevation, which are vertical or up and down. Range is measured in meters, and then frequency um, is measured by using the Doppler effect, which I'll talk to these in the next few slides. So in terms of radar fundamentals, um, I wanted to try providing analogies. Uh, so hopefully these are a little bit relatable. An electromagnetic wave propagates just like light does. Um, they're invisible uh, waves, but they're longer in wavelength. So imagine the visible spectrum is one micron in wavelength, and that's 10 to the negative six. So an electromagnetic wave will travel at the speed of light uh, much faster. So it's three centimeters in wavelength. And it propagates like sound, but it's a different mechanism. So sound compresses in the atmosphere and an electromagnetic wave is two orthogonal or perpendicular fields, electric and magnetic. So um, for instance, if you're operating your radio using amplitude modulation, AM, you can always tune to a different frequency and use frequency modulation or FM. So there you can see the spectrum of um, the electromagnetic waves. On this slide, um, I tried laying out the five basic components of a radar subsystem. So the transmitter is responsible for generating the electromagnetic wave. So you can think of that as a light bulb. The antenna, um, usually a big flat dish, will direct the beam in the direction that you want it to go in. So uh, a flashlight, for instance, will have the same kind of uh, concept. The signal that is generated um, will hit a target and then some of it will reflect or bounce back towards the radar. Um, so you can shine a, uh, a light in the mirror and kind of visualize the same thing. A receiver will receive um, and detect the reflected signal. So that's like your eye. And then the signal processor or data processor works the same as your brain would by processing the signal and then trying to look for any characteristics that are important um, depending on the application, whether it's a weather radar or military radar um, in the case of F-18. So in terms of radar measurements, uh, I think the most important one is the radar range equation. Um, whenever you take a double E class, this is like the most exciting thing you learn, in my opinion. Um, but you can uh, derive uh, target information, but from different measurements, like angular position that comes from where the antenna is physically pointing its angles. The size of the target is based on the power that's um, measured by the received radio waves. And then uh, speed and discrimination really rely on Doppler or frequency. So I'll explain to you how to calculate range. Um, there's a fancy equation there. 2 times r divided by c. But if you think about it, 
a signal has to travel from one point to a target. So you can see that in the lower um, right hand corner. And then it has to travel back. So the round trip distance from that signal that's transmitted or the pulse to the target and back is twice the range. And again, uh, these radio waves travel at the speed of light. So that's designated by the variable C or Charlie. So the delay time to a target is 2R divided by C. Time always corresponds to range for radar. So here's a picture of um, the orthogonal or perpendicular uh, radio waves. Uh, we have a series of equations that tell us that um, charged particles or electrons produce electric fields. And these electric fields are proportional to twice or the square of the radius. Um, so here we have E for the electric field and B for the magnetic field. And these um, both propagate um, in space and time. So there's a series of equations developed by Maxwell, um, Gauss's law for electricity, Gauss's law for magnetism, Faraday's law, and the Ampere-Maxwell law. So you don't need to understand all of these um, today or for a long time, but just know that they exist. There's physics behind radio waves and electromagnetics are just that. Radio waves that oscillate um, with, in terms of electric and mag magnetic waves. So um, there's other things involved with electromagnetic waves, how they interact with the material in the atmosphere. They can reflect or refract, absorb or diffract. But the APG-73 radar uses all of these principles. Um, it's an airborne radar system that has uh, weapons control. It's coherent, it's multi-channel and multi-mode. It can search and track in space. And there's a lot of flexibility to do many missions for the warfighter. So real quickly, I'll run through some generic displays. Um, these you can look up yourself. Uh, you can look up A, B, and C displays, or scopes is also a popular term. So an A display will give you the amplitude of a receiver, and it will plot that versus a horizontal range. So the x-axis, um, I just mapped out some ranges that increment by 10 nautical miles. So this A scope or display is used to discriminate a target against that noise or clutter in the background. So then you have the B display and these targets are displayed as little blips or raw hits um, on a rectangular plot. And this is azimuth, um, again, horizontal uh, versus range, which is the vertical axis. So if a radar can see um, 120 degrees in azimuth, you can locate um, where the target is positioned as long as you understand um, how the radar scans. So what I do in my mind is I draw imaginary lines across each axis. So here the range is between 20 and 30 nautical miles and the azimuth is on the left side of the center. So that means it's negative. And um, the ticks are incrementing in 20 degree um, increments. So the range would be roughly 22 nautical miles and the azimuth would be negative 13 nautical miles. So the C display will give you pretty similar information, but in this case, you'll have elevation angle and azimuth. So the reference point here is in the center of the display at the zero zero mark. So the radar will physically scan in space um, in elevation bars and then in azimuth. So I just have some animations here to try to show you all as the radar scans in space, each bar and each azimuth width, it is going to detect a new target. So here we have three targets and on your C scope or C display, you would have a big rectangle that shows you where your radar is scanning in the physical space. And you may not be able to see them um, physically with your eyes, but your radar can definitely see them with all of the waves. So the APG-73 radar um, also supports fire control or weapon systems. Uh, the AIM-120 or air intercept um, missile is uh, works hand in hand with the radar to send target information so that in 
um, an air to air mission scenario after searching and tracking a target, um, we can definitely keep our warfighters safe. So radar is not just understanding electromagnetic waves, but it goes uh, much farther than that. Being able to use the fighter and interceptor missions um, to be able to accomplish a goal is just as important as understanding the basics. So um, if we have time for questions or comments, then we will get to those. But I just wanted to leave you with my three simple ifs in life um, along the route um, from intern to engineer, I learned um, five key things. You can model the way, you know, be a leader, enable others to act, challenge the process, and encourage the heart. Uh, but I have three simple ifs that um, I recite to myself uh, pretty consistently uh, so that I remember how to focus on my goals. Um, if you do not go after what you want, you will never have it. If you do not ask, the answer will always be no. And if you do not step forward, you will always be in the same place. So I thank everybody for your time. Um, it was really exciting to be able to share my story with you and the basics of radar. Uh, I hope that you got something out of this and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, coming soon, hopefully by the end of next year, or this year or early next year, I'll have a website. Um, developed by myself. Uh, I already have a Google domain. So www.karinaq.dev uh, will be coming live soon. So please uh, be on the lookout. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Have you ever thought of going to space? And would you be an engineer in space if you could? I have never considered going to space, but I would definitely keep an open mind to that. Um, I feel like there's a lot of uh, great electrical engineering roles and responsibilities to be executed and uh, radar can definitely be applied on a space application, not just military. All right, thank you, Karina. We're gonna have to move on to Chris Reynolds now for our second presentation. Chris, if you would like to go ahead, you can share your screen. Thank you, Karina. Thank you very much. Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, fantastic. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? At least somebody. Okay. All right, so um, I apologize, I don't have video today. Um, I unfortunately, just don't have video on the work laptop here, and I am actually at work. Um, but my name is Chris Reynolds. Uh, I work at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works uh, in Palmdale, California. And I'll go over a quick presentation here today. I'm going to talk a little bit about Skunk Works and then talk about um, kind of my passion, which is actually uh, STEM engagement and a competition that we call the Aerospace Robotics Competition. Um, so I'll talk for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'll leave it open for uh, some Q&A. All right, so on the second slide here, again, my name is Chris Reynolds. Um, there's my uh, professional headshot. Um, but uh, my background is I actually went to the University of Michigan. I graduated somewhat recently in 2017, my master's in aerospace engineering. Um, I am what we call a conceptual design engineer, uh, again, at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works in Palmdale. Uh, I actually grew up outside of Philadelphia um, and then moved across the country. So very similar to Karina, you know, you know, took the leap, you know, all the way from the East Coast out here to the West Coast. Um, outside of actually my work, which I'm very passionate about, I really enjoy volunteering in classrooms and um, engaging in STEM activities just like this. And that's actually what I'm going to talk about for most of my stuff today. Um, the, what I call the Aerospace Robotics Competition, which is in Antelope Valley, and it's a pretty exciting, something that students can get involved in. Um, however, in my spare time, I do really like to do um, things like photography. Um, so the picture up to the right, um, Karina might like this, you know, a few F-18 growlers. Uh, flying around, um, getting that nice expansion wave there in the back. So even though I'm a Lockheed guy, I like Lockheed planes, you know, the Boeing F-18, there's nothing like it. So I love taking pictures of um, aerial photography. I also like cycling and all things outdoors. So I am a person too, um, but I also am an engineer and I do really enjoy engineering. Uh, so moving on. So uh, Palmdale, if you don't know, it's a home of Skunk Works. So this is kind of a picture of it. Um, it is the desert. Uh, but I think it's very beautiful. It has a very nice aesthetic appeal, the mountains in the background. Um, this is where I spend a lot of my time, what we call Plant 42. Uh, there's a sort of a runway off, 
up there to the right. You can't quite see it here. Um, a lot of cool things have happened here at the Palmdale Skunk Works, and I've got just a few quick slides on it. I've essentially been here for about uh, five years, and over those five years, I say I've got to do a lot of fun stuff, but I also have to learn about the very rich history of it. So on slide four here, really the skunk work started um, back in about 1943 in Burbank, California, before we moved to Palmdale. And the idea was to create a small group of dedicated engineers uh, within a larger Lockheed Martin company that are going to work on these really kind of small projects that are really important to uh, really what we call urgent national need. Um, so if we go low and look to the left, that's actually a picture of the very first jet fighter um, that the, the uh, Blue Forces in World War II had. Um, it was built in 143 days by the Skunk Works. So right there and early on, um, essentially the Skunk Works was known for what we call creating special mission aircraft. Uh, so rather than going and creating, you know, maybe your, your standard commercial airliner, uh, the Skunk Works was really uh, tasked with making these what we call one-off vehicles. Uh, so if we keep going on, the, the one in the middle, the one that says eight months, that's what we call a U-2. And, and at the time, we had no way to look into what the Soviet Union was doing with their missiles. Um, so Kelly Johnson, which was the founder of the Skunk Works, and his small team of dedicated engineers in eight months got this vehicle to fly. And it's actually still flying today and still doing a lot of important work. And then to the right of that, um, you have uh, the SR-71 and also the F-117. Again, very, very, um, uh, what we call urgent and special aircraft. Uh, the SR-71 flew at Mach 3.2. That's 3.2 times the speed of sound. And what that meant to do is, again, with the Soviet Union, uh, we had to uh, find a way to make sure that essentially they were, they were doing things that they're supposed to be doing and not what they're not supposed to be doing. Um, so it was a very key aircraft. And then, of course, the one on the right, the F-117, um, that's a big one, what we call stealth. So I'm sure Karina knows a little bit about stealth. She just talked about radar. Um, essentially, this is being undetectable to radar. Uh, it was a huge advancement that the Skunk Works kind of pioneered. And of course, now all different companies use stealth. And it is a huge benefit of uh, essentially the United States um, Air Forces. So you know, the bottom line here is the Skunk Works is, is special because it works on these uh, specialized aircraft throughout history. And that's really kind of where we live. Now, what I do is I do conceptual design. And a lot of people ask me, what is conceptual design? And, and you know, I usually tell them it's a very fun job. But, but in reality, what we do is we balance all the disciplines. Uh, and what I mean by that is an airplane is built by lots of different types of engineers. You got mechanical engineers, radar engineers, electrical engineers, system engineers. What the conceptual design engineer does is kind of make them all work together into a balanced solution. So it is sometimes more of an art than an engineering discipline. Uh, sometimes I'm literally at my desk kind of drawing airplanes. Um, the other times I'm really actually working on kind of technical details. Um, it's, it's a lot about bringing innovative ideas together, a lot of cross-pollination between groups and working in very diverse sets of uh, backgrounds. Um, so at the Skunk Works, one thing I'm very proud of is the folks that I work with. A lot of diversity here in the Skunk Works, which I think we could always do better. But I think we are at a good spot. And that brings a lot of really uh, disparate ideas to the, to the table which helped create a very cool solution. So the background image is, you know, one of our kind of things we put together, which was the next generation fighter, one of our concepts that we put together a while ago. Um, so I have a lot of fun with my job. Uh, it's essentially, even though I'm an aerospace engineer, you know, sometimes I wear a lot of different hats that I'll call it. Um, and it's a lot of artistic uh, uh, capabilities involved as well. So that's all about Lockheed. I want to switch gears now to a competition that Lockheed actually funds, um, but really mainly what I want to focus on for my little talk here, which is what I call the Aerospace Robotics Competition. Now, ARC, what we call it, which stands for Aerospace Robotics Competition, was something we started back in 2015. And this is a competition that is meant for high school students uh, throughout the country. Now, we also run it in Antelope Valley. Um, which is actually why I really wanted to talk about it during this session because folks in the Antelope Valley can actually get involved in this. So who is ARC? Essentially, it's a team of directors and nonprofit across the country. Um, we've got two engineers at the Skunk Works. We've got a retired um, test pilot 
uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tucker Hamilton, who used to be the commander of F-35 at Edwards Air Force Base. He's on our, he's actually our CEO of the nonprofit. We've got a really strong team that's excited about essentially bringing drones and STEM uh, to students. So what are the objectives? Uh, essentially, we've got three main objectives is, and, and the picture describes it all to the right. We want to get students um, designing and building and flying a drone just like that. That's actually an exact picture of the drone that we have the teams build. Um, we try to teach uh, knowledge of unmanned autonomous systems and essentially how they work because they are an ever important thing in aerospace going forward. And also we try to teach some basic aerospace principles as well. Um, the, the big thing is though, we're trying, a lot of these competitions are reserved for college students and universities, which I did when I was in college. I never had the opportunity to do this when I was in high school. And we're trying to bring that opportunity to high school students. Um, one of the big things about this that I'll emphasize is low cost. It is very, um, you know, FIRST Robotics, if you're familiar with it, is a little, can be pricey sometimes. Some schools have trouble participating, um, but our competition is, is much, much lower cost than that, um, which has allowed a lot of the Antelope Valley schools to actually play and participate in, and even some homeschooling uh, schools as well to participate in this event, which is kind of unprecedented. Um, so we're quite proud of it. If I go on here to slide nine, just to kind of uh, some pictures, uh, back in 2019, 2020, our competition was focused on designing a drone that would pick up Connects cubes. So students would literally, you know, once they had their drone design based on the kit that we provided, they would fly it around and they would design a mechanism that would be the best way to retrieve Connects cubes. It was super exciting to watch. And unfortunately, we weren't able to have the competition because of the pandemic. Um, but it was really cool to see the teams going out and participating and practicing. And uh, we had very successful competitions the years before as well. So the competition in a nutshell uh, on slide 10 here, we have three portions. We have what we call semi-autonomous, which is what I showed before, but now for this coming year, instead of picking up uh, Connects cubes, we're actually gonna have you retrieve tennis balls. Uh, then there's the autonomous portion, which is where we get into kind of really more of the advanced topics of actually having the drone fly all by itself. So you program waypoints into it and it goes from waypoint to waypoint. Um, and really, it's getting this, this kind of complex idea of autonomy into the high school uh, students, um, you know, curriculum, stuff like that, which the students have really, really enjoyed learning about and gives them a big leg up going into college as well. And of course, there's a presentation, which essentially gives us a chance to interface with uh, you, the students, and give you some, some feedback and then talk about um, kind of, uh, you know, what you've designed, what you could do better next time. So what we try to do to make sure teams succeed is we have actually created a lot of tutorials from the nonprofit, things like Drones 101. You know, a drone is what we picture here to the right. Um, sometimes call this is one a, a quadcopter, which is a specific type of drone. Uh, we teach small programming, autonomy, and more. Uh, however, the thing we are most proud of is our mentorship program. So each high school team gets a Lockheed Martin mentor uh, or another mentor from a different aerospace company here in the Antelope Valley. And essentially, you meet every few weeks and, and have some communication over email and phone as well. Uh, we also really emphasize having diversity in our mentors as well. Um, this year, we had two all-female teams actually compete and do very, very well, um, which is, again, something that we're, we're really pride ourselves on in terms of trying to promote diversity in the STEM fields. So... Uh, Essentially, this is the exciting slide here. Uh, we actually are running a competition for 2020, 2021. And we are going out very soon here and looking for folks that are interested in, in getting involved. What we're gonna do because of the pandemic is we're gonna do a virtual uh, component in the fall essentially, and then slowly transition to hopefully, you know, cross our fingers an in-person event in, in the, the uh, spring of 2021. Uh, we have a way to actually run simulations online that we've purchased as a nonprofit so that it's free of charge for our teams. And uh, we're also gonna have a series of talks, essentially just like this throughout the year. Uh, so there's a rough schedule of how things are gonna go. And essentially very soon here, uh, there's gonna be a release for um, any interest and teams can start gathering and applying. And again, uh, everything is free of charge right now. So it's, it's kind of a, an open thing and we can, make sure we get that information out to you. So with, uh, with that being said, we actually do have a website, which is aeroboticscomp.com uh, slash region. 
country that has some videos on it, which I apologize, I couldn't play today. Uh, but the videos actually are on the website if you want to go see it. You can always feel free to email us as well. Um, but I want to emphasize that this, this is a competition that you know anyone is open and welcome to do. We have homeschool groups within uh, the Antelope Valley that get involved, lots of different school districts as well. I think I saw Diane Walker online today. Um, she's been a huge proponent of the Antelope Valley School District. And we're looking forward to trying to run this competition again this year and do our best that we can during, uh, during the pandemic. Um, but I, I kind of end here with, with one final saying is, you know, I'm really passionate about getting involved in, in the community and, and essentially STEM engagement like this. Um, so even though I'm an engineer by day, you know, I want to give back um, to students and stuff like that. And Lockheed is very much committed to that as well. Um, so if you have any questions at all, certainly feel free to send us an email. But I did want to keep this a little short because I want to save some time for any, any Q&A you might have. Okay, Chris, uh, what can students do to prepare for your competition? That is a, that is a great question. Um, there's a lot of resources out there right now on, on drones and autonomy. Um, actually, MIT has a lot of good resources they put out recently. Um, but actually, there's a link on one of my slides to what we call drone blocks. And it's droneblocks.io. And it's actually an online kind of open source software that allows you to go in and, and there's actually tutorials um, and it actually is a simulation as well. You can go online, you can fly around your own drone. It's pretty interesting. Um, in addition to that, actually at our website, we have some of the nonprofit uh, self-created tutorials as well uh, that kind of teach you the basics of autonomy. About, uh, if volunteers want to get involved, what would they do to get involved? So that's a great question. Uh, we actually are about to put out a call for new volunteers this year. And uh, the, the first step would be, you know, feel free to email me, but we put that email on the last slide, arrow.robotics.com uh, at gmail.com. If you shoot us an email, we would love to have some mentors. We're actually, last year we focused on Lockheed Martin mentors, but we're trying to encourage and getting um, some other companies within the Antelope Valley involved as well and being a mentor for the competition. Uh, and I should mention now that this is actually a national competition. It's, it's not just in the Antelope Valley. I emphasize the Antelope Valley because obviously that's what, what we're focused on right now. This, this competition occurs in, in actually the East Coast as well, in Florida. Um, and we're looking to expand even further as we go into the future. Okay. Uh, how when you were uh, a teenager, what, uh, what did you expect to, excuse me, what did you expect to have the job you have now? So, no, I, I never would have. Um, so part of the reason I, I love actually running this competition, this nonprofit is because um, there was a, an engineer, uh, they work at SpaceX and they kind of mentored me when I was in high school. And they actually taught me a lot of uh, stuff, did tech talks like this and talking about actually rocketry. And they always said and encouraged me that I could, I could make it to, to a spot like this in my career. And I, I just never, never truly believed them, but they always believed in me. And that was really important. And I think we find through this competition that um, we encourage our students to kind of, you know, believe in themselves and understand that they actually could, um, you know, go to college and get a degree and, and become in this step because I, I never would have imagined that I could call myself an engineer at Lockheed Martin Stuff Works. Um, it's, it's really kind of a dream job for me. Um, sometimes I really, I really uh, I have to pinch myself sometimes. I do really, really cool stuff. Uh, but again, that's why I'm so passionate about giving back because I feel like I would not have been, gotten to this point if it weren't for mentors. Um, I was actually the first person in my family to go to college too. Probably something I should have mentioned before. Um, so I never really had many mentors in my own family. Luckily, I just had one person that really believed in me and kind of mentored me a little bit. And that really helped me and pushed me to apply for college and then, you know, start pursuing my dream of being in the aerospace industry. What, 
what do you find is the most important thing to remember as kids pursue their education now? I think the most important thing to remember is always keep an eye on your passion. So even though if someone tells you to, you know, hey, you're good at math, you should be an engineer. That's great and all, but always think about what gets, what gets you excited, what motivates you. At the end of the day, what are, what, um, the, the best quote that I ever heard is, do the things that give you energy, not the things that drain you of energy. Um, so, you know, for me, um, writing and, and, and reading is very important, but it, it's, it's something that drains my energy, right? Um, but, but math and science and physics is something that, you know, I could do for hours and hours and be really excited about. And that's, that's kind of why I, I went towards engineering. Um, so I, I just encourage you that, you know, you want to find your passion and don't be afraid to find it too late. You know, let's say you're, you get to the later stages of high school or even college and you want to change your major. That's okay. People do that all the time. Um, you're, you're never going to be able to truly be happy doing something that you're kind of forced into. It's, it's just really tough. So I always encourage people to uh, always take a step back and think about what gets you excited. And, and that's what you should go and pursue. So when you were younger, what excited you? And uh, how did that drive you to where you are now? So actually, that's a really good question. So I, when I was younger, I, I mean, obviously I had no idea I wanted to be an airspace engineer until one day I went to an air show. And there was actually an air show outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and I, I actually really believe in the power of air shows, which I'm, so I'm kind of bummed we had a, um, the spring air show had to be canceled because of the pandemic. Um, you know, when I was there and I got to go to some of the STEM booths and see the airplanes flying around, again, I left that day so energized and excited that I just simply knew that uh, even though I wanted, I knew I wanted to be an engineer, I knew then that I wanted to be an aerospace engineer and get involved in the aerospace industry. Um, so it was, it wasn't until that moment though that again, I found my passion at that air show. I talked to some pilots, I talked to some engineers, I got to, you know, sitting in a cockpit of an airplane. It was just, it was an incredible experience. So the one thing I encourage students to do, say you do like math and science, maybe you're not sure what kind of engineer you want to be, um, go to car shows, you know, go to air shows and start trying to get engaged in different types of engineering fields. And see which one kind of piques your interest the most. So what kind of technology would you like to most see implemented today? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, so being in the aerospace industry, uh, you know, I think uh, what we call urban air mobility is probably the biggest thing that we should be looking to implement soon and specifically electric urban air mobility. So essentially the drones that I showed in my slides, think of taking them and increasing the size by, you know, five, 10, 15 times so that they can hold a person and have them be electric powered so that they can get people from point A to point B. Um, the big key with that is enabling mobility for anybody. Uh, so right now, um, let's say train systems and even access to cars are something that you have to have uh, well, you either have to be in the right location for, or you have to have money for. So I envision a future where we have urban air mobility that is widely available and cheap, so that everyone can be connected to the world essentially, and in a green way too, not with emitting um, extra carbon dioxide emissions, but actually using actual electric, um, electrically powered aircraft. You know, so I think that's the the biggest technology that. If I didn't work at Lockheed and the Skunk Works, that's probably where I would work. I would work at one of the startup companies that's working on trying to make essentially a flying taxi, that's what I'll call it, where you can hop in and fly to your destination point and anyone can be able to do that. Um, that's actually something I'm really passionate about and, and who knows, someday I might try to go and, and work on something like that. But you know, to me, that's that seems like the next biggest, most important innovation that needs to be discovered in the next uh, or solved, I should say, in the next 10 or 15 years. Okay, Chris, uh, what is your greatest challenge in achieving your goals? Mm. 
So that's another good question. Um, I, I'd say the greatest challenge has been myself. And uh, so I'll, I'll go into a little bit of a, a sidebar here. So again, I mentioned that I was a first generation college student, right? Um, when I went to college, I was not ready at all. And I had a lot of doubts about myself. Um, something we call the imposter syndrome. So I always felt like I never belonged. And even today, when I, when actually when I work, when I walked into work today, I went to a meeting and I've been here for five years, but I still, I sat in that meeting and I felt like I didn't belong here. So and all my, and it's a lot of people that I know, a lot of friends that I know, you know, struggle with it. You just, you never quite feel like you belong. Um, however, that's not true at all. You know, I, I've talked to vice presidents and directors that still feel like sometimes they, you know, their biggest enemy is themselves. So I really encourage to find a good mentor and, and that mentor is always going to be someone who's going to be there to essentially kind of walk you down, so to speak, you know, encourage you, build confidence in you because I um, mean, all my life, I've been my, my own biggest enemy. Um, again, just always not, not feeling like I'm, like I'm in the right place or not supposed to be there, um, you know, struggling through college and things like that. Even though I was doing really well, I was doing well in my classes. Just, I always, uh, you know, you're, you're, they always say you're your own worst enemy, and that is that is very true, especially when you're getting into the into the STEM field. So, and again, that's why I go back to really encouraging you know finding a good mentor. Um, if you don't have a mentor but you want one, email me. I'd be happy to be your mentor. Uh, if too many of you email me, I'll find you a mentor and and certainly be able to support you. I think that's really important. Well, thanks, Chris. We appreciate you spending time with us today. Of course, thanks for having me. Sorry I can't have the video again, but I really, really appreciate the time. Thank you all for joining today and that brings our session to a close. Have a good day.